uh, concerning uh, fellowship and call this John's, John's Fellowship. And obviously this here, this, this fellowship is with his, <clears throat> with his Savior, with his God, with the Lord. And uh, thank God for, for good fellowship, amen. And it's always good to have fellowship with the brethren and that kind of stuff, but um, that, that usually is centered around the Lord. You need to have a fellowship. Uh, a maintaining and a running fellowship, and I'm talking about saved people now, with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, your Christian life will be deader than a hammer. <laughs> It'll be deader than a hammer if, uh, if you have no fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's quiet in here. Maybe we need to sing four or five more songs. Amen. Everybody, everybody's uh, maybe thinking about tomorrow or thinking about the weekend or whatever it is, but you guys are eerily quiet. But uh, nonetheless, you need to have a fellowship with the Lord. You just sang the song, uh, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And uh, it's easy to get caught up in the cares and affairs of this life without looking at it through the lens, if you will, or the scope of the Word of God or through the lens of your fellowship with, with, with your God and with Jesus Christ. Things that happen to you, and I, I know there's all kind of stuff, and again, we say these kind of things, we're not Calvinists and all that, but, but God, listen, you need to look for God's hand in everything you do. You need to look for God's hand and stuff that's going on around you. Now, I'm not saying he's behind all of it and he's making it all happen, but I'm saying this, he, he can be with you in it and whatever's going on, and he can, uh, again, you love the Lord, uh, the verse over there in Romans 8, he can work, work that for your, good, for, for your good, for his glory, and he wants to use you, that's a hard one sometimes, but he wants to use you in all, any and all circumstances that come into your life. And if you're not in step halfway in fellowship with the Lord, you're going to have a hard time seeing any of that. And when all that stuff mounts up and when the pressure does get heavy and all that, and you don't see God anywhere, and because you, your fellowship is not where it should be, it's going to be real easy for you to get depressed and down and all discouraged and all that stuff, more so than if you were walking with the Lord. Now, Peter, James, John... Uh, knew the Lord Jesus Christ. They had fellowship directly with Him. But especially, especially John. John, obviously I'm pointing John out because they were in 1 John. He's the writer of the epistle. He, he knows the Lord and has, has got a relationship with the Lord that just seems to be a little bit closer, if you will, a little bit different than the rest of the apostles. Uh, that's, we're talking about the apostle... Um, known as that disciple whom Jesus loved. That's written in the book of John. You say, well, John wrote that. Yeah, but he writes it under the inspiration of God. And the Lord allows him to do that. And um, um, he's, got a, he's got this relationship with Jesus Christ that is, I mean, uh, again, we've heard it said and preached and taught on, but he's at the Last Supper there. <clears throat> and the Lord says, all right, one of you guys are going to betray me. And he's grieved and heavy in spirit and he, he th throws that on them and dumps that on them and the next thing you know they're all looking at one another is it I is it I and asking the Lord is it I is it I and everybody's looking across the table at each other like uh, is it you and it might be you because I've seen you do some things lately that just kind of make me nervous anyway uh, but and John doesn't buy, uh, buy into any of that he doesn't fall into any of that he just looks at the Lord and he and he says who is it Lord why? Because he's got a fellowship with the Lord. John knew his place with the Lord. He knew it. And um, uh, so he, he talks about fellowship here. And uh, I think when John writes about it, he's probably got some things to say. He knows a little bit about fellowship and with the Lord. Now let's read here. In the context of chapter 1 here is fellowship. And so we're going to read all of chapter 1 and into chapter 2. It's very short, so it won't take us that long. So look at chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled 
of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship, there's fellowship, with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. You know why some Christians never have joy? Because their fellowship's all messed up. You, listen, you buy into this stuff that's being pushed and preached and taught out here in modern Christianity today that uh, you serve God, He'll bless the fire out of you and give you all kinds of material wealth and blessings and health and all this kind of stuff. Um, you might be disappointed and your joy won't be full. That, a lot of that crowd, it's a superficial, it's a very shallow fellowship they have with God. God is a big candy stick. And uh, God is there uh, just as a means to supply and to bless and to give blessings. No, that's not, I mean, I'm not saying God don't do those things and God can't dump things on you and, and uh, won't and all that. Uh, if it's according to His will, He, he will do that. But, but sometimes that may not, may not be God's will for you uh, and some of that stuff. And so don't get discouraged. Uh, when it does necessarily doesn't go your way, our way, however you want to say that. Verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. I like that verse. It was, because I don't like the dark. See, you're afraid of the dark? No, I'm afraid of the dark. I don't like the dark. I like light. Amen. Verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him, who's Him? That's God. For if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Well, a lot of people doing that today. But if we walk in the light as He, that's God, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Uh, and someone said, well, that's the brethren there. Well, that's also you and God. You walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. Verse 6 is the context of you and God having fellowship. All right, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, you and God, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. These are some great verses right here. If we confess our sins, talking about saved people, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Praise God for that. And he is the propitiation, praise the Lord for that one too, for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. All right, we'll stop there. Now, I've said it, I've heard it preached, I believe it, I've taught it, I've heard it preached many, many years. The main thing that you want to do in your Christian life is, is not necessarily win souls or pray a bunch of prayer or read the Bible 500 times before you die or the Lord comes. Although all those things are good, and they are. That's good to read your Bible, you ought to. You ought to read it every day if you can. You ought to, you ought to do some praying, amen. And you ought to try to be a witness and, uh, and, um, in the Christian life. But the main thing, the main thing in your Christian life is maintaining and, uh, if you will, developing and growing in this thing of fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. And, uh, and I know all those, some of those other things come into play with that as far as the Word of God and prayer and all that. And even, even soul winning comes into play with some of that. But that is the main, that is the main thing. So I want to give you some things uh, concerning uh, fellowship this morning. Why do you say, why do you say this? Um, you preached this kind of thing before. Uh, listen, uh, look around the room. Now granted, I know it's a holiday weekend. And I know some people are quarantining and all that. But you can't, t some people look at this and they go, well, same crowd today. And you get discouraged with it. Well, I'm going to tell you something. 
uh, we may or may not be coming out of the, uh, coming out of the, and I hate to even mention to bring this stuff up, but it should be, it should be mentioned from time to time, I think, uh, especially to the church and all that kind of stuff. I think it needs to be addressed, and that's the, this business of COVID and all that. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you what you should and shouldn't do as far as uh, vaccines and treatments and all that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, simply saying this. You cannot deny the fact that that has had an effect on the church. Has it not? Not just this church, but all over the country, all over the entire world. It has had an effect, so why ignore it and not preach and say anything about it? You, you, that, would be, that would be ludicrous to do that. That would be insanity to do that. Well, I mean, a church this size, I mean, uh, four or five people contract it, that's going to put a hurting on us. Six or seven, eight, nine, that's put a hurting on us. Amen? And so you need to, need to understand uh, some things about, listen, uh, whether, whether you, you don't know, you don't know what next week's going to bring. And I'm not trying to be, oh, look out, it's coming. I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying, you don't know. And everybody in here has read their fair share of pros and cons. Everybody in here has probably read their fair share of uh, the conspiratorial side versus, you know, uh, the opposite side. And, and the medical and, and, and all. Everybody in here has probably got their own view and their own opinion of it. That's not even the issue. That's not... What I'm saying is this. You don't know what next month's going to bring. You can surmise and you can say, here we go, here comes another strain. Or How do you say that, strain? Here comes another strain. Didn't they say that just the other day there's another one? A third one? Number three, if the first one didn't get you, and if that one didn't get you, we'll throw another one at you. Put your mask back on. Stay in your house. Don't go to church. Only the essential stuff. Get you some gas and food. Store up. Stock up. Buck her down. Now again, we could go, we could, we could lay out examples and illustrations of how a mask works. We could lay out examples and illustrations of how a mask does not work. Right? We could, I could pitch both sides to you, but I'm not going to do that. I'm simply saying this. In the midst, listen, until... You don't know what's going to happen before the Lord comes. I do know this. The Bible talks about perilous times in the last days. And like we were talking just the other day. Who knows what God is doing, whether He's taking His... Say what you want to, it's man-made. Okay, fine. But who's to say God's not taking His hand of mercy off and saying, okay, you don't want me no more? You can have this. You want to ignore me? I mean, what did... And I know we're not in the Old Testament. I know we're not Jews and all that. But what did He promise the nation of Israel? You serve me, and I'll keep these diseases off of it. You want to find out how God deals with a nation? You read the Old Testament. You know what he did with Israel back there? He said, you follow me, you keep my statutes, my precepts, I'll keep your enemies off of you here, there, and, every, and then I'll keep these diseases and this and this, I'll bless them. And I know that's Old Testament, I know that. But who's to say, I mean, we're coming down, we're getting back to this thing, we're almost to the end of this church age, God's attention now is beginning to swing back towards that nation over there. And who's to say God ain't just saying, okay, you know what, I'll just take my hand off. I mean, my people, they don't want to go to church anyway, so, I mean, they spend all their time looking at a screen anyway, so. Yeah, but preacher, the world, I know the world we live in. I, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying in the midst of all of this, you don't, listen, who knows, who knows, don't get alarmed, who knows where this church will be one year from now? You don't know. We don't know. 
if the Lord tarries one year, two years from now. So and so might get mad and run off. COVID might come through here in a sweeping thing and take 15 people out. So oh, God forbid, preach. I, I mean, have you not read about the Black Plague? How many people did it take out? I mean, it was just wiping them out. I think it was during that time. I think it was the Black Plague. I think it was during that time. What year was that? Anybody remember what years those were? Black Plague? That's way back. How about the Bubonic Plague? Same thing? I think, it was, I think it was the Black Plague. Mueller, George Mueller. You know what they had going on? I know this. They had a plague sweeping through Europe, or London, and England. And George Mueller had just taken a church over there in Bristol. I think it was Bristol. One of those, I forget now which one location was. I should have studied up a little closer. But he, just, he had just taken a church. He had just taken a church, and this thing begins to sweep in. You know, what, you know how George Mueller was paid? He had a box in the back like that. And he said, I'm not going to tax God's people in the church because it's a small church, it's a poor church, but we're going to live by faith, me and my wife, and we're going to put a box back there. And if you want to drop something in there, some shillings or two or three, that's what we're going to live off of. And he didn't preach on money, 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 money. If you know anything about George Mueller, he'd get down and pray. He wouldn't ask nobody for a dime. Or a shilling. And he has this church going, small crowd, country people. He got a box in the back. People are dropping a few things in, barely getting by. And all of a sudden now, here sweeps in this plague. And some of his people's getting sick. Some of them are dying. And he tells his wife, I got to go see them. And it was highly contagious, six feet. <laughs> you know what Mueller did? He got and prayed about it, and he said, Honey, I believe God told me to go. I'm going. I'm going to go pray with old man so-and-so. I'm going to go pray with old Mrs. So-and-so. And, -so. and uh, she stands at the door and watches him go. Well, the Lord brought him. Now, I know the Lord brought him through, but what am I simply saying? I'm simply saying this. You read about all that he goes and he prays with them. Some of them made it, some of them didn't. And you read about his ministry, and it just takes off from there, and God blesses it, and the orphanages, and all those things. And we look at George Mueller, what a great man of faith! Well, I heard the verse this weekend. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. You going to maintain your faith throughout all of this? Now, I realize some of you right now, you're so far, you're kind of like, preach this cakewalk. Well, maybe to you, but it ain't to everybody. Maybe it is to you, but it ain't to everybody. And I know this, listen, uh, throughout, uh, again, you don't know what's going to be pitched at you next week. You don't know what's coming down the road next month. But I know this, if you will maintain your fellowship with Jesus Christ, you can handle whatever, whatever's thrown at you no matter what's thrown at you. Amen. I know it's a big statement, but that's a true statement. No matter what is thrown at you in this life or something that may terminate this life, if your fellowship with Jesus Christ is where it should be, you can handle about anything that comes down your road. Now you can say what you want to about Job and all the secret stuff about that and all the uh, the trouble that he had and what's the secret to his success and, and Job was a sinner and he was proud and all that and God had to deal with him and all that and say what you want to about all that but I believe this I believe even at the start of that whole thing I believe Job's fellowship with God was right if it hadn't have been right he'd have quit if it hadn't have been right he'd have cursed God I believe that you know why some Christians get mad at God? They get out of fellowship. They get hit with a blow, blindsided, whatever, and they get 
out of fellowship. All right, let's look here. A couple things down through this chapter. I want you to notice in verse 2 that the word of life is made manifested. Look at verse 2. For the life, uh, when he talks about the word of life there in verse 1, which is Jesus Christ incarnate there. But then in verse 2, for the life was manifested, the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Now obviously Jesus Christ was manifested to them. He was mani- God was manifest in the flesh, in the body of Jesus Christ, and uh, they handled Him, uh, they looked on Him, and it says there in verse 1, Our hands have handled, they handled Him. Uh, but he was, the Word of Life was made manifest. Now I want to say, number one, in order to have fellowship with God, you see here, you have a means of eternal life. You have a means of eternal life. What is that? And you know what that is. I'm, it looks like this morning I'm preaching to a lot of saved people, if not all. Looks like all, but Jesus Christ is the means of eternal life. That's very clear from the passage. Without Him, you don't have eternal life. We know that, and we say amen to that. And a lot of you are shaking your heads, and, and it's Jesus Christ plus or minus nothing. Jesus Christ not counting the church. Jesus Christ not counting water. Jesus Christ not counting your good works or anybody else's. It's Him, and it's Him alone. He is the means of eternal life. Now, having said that, He is the means of you having fellowship with God. The lost man has no fellowship with God. That's like I was saying before, and I believe it's true. Uh, I I believe that a lot of people, they say prayers. I hear them say it all the time when tragedy happens and all that. You hear all kinds of news anchors, and you hear people on radio and uh, see people on TV and you see people on Facebook and all that. Our prayers are with you. We're praying for you and, and we're saying prayers and this and that and the other. I just wonder how many of them are even actually doing anything. I don't believe a lot of them are. I'm not saying they're not praying. I'm saying I believe they're praying. But I'm saying this, God turns a deaf ear to some of it. I believe God turns a deaf ear to a lot of it. Not that he doesn't hear. He just doesn't do anything. Why? He has no fellowship with those people. Now, he can or can't. We went through all that, and I'm not going to go through that this morning. He can or can't if he so chooses and use the circumstance to manifest himself, glorify himself, and deal with people and all that. But as far as the average natural man out there, lost man, saying prayers to God, God don't pay attention to that stuff. Why? Because the prayer of the abomination is wicked. God don't pay no, Some people look at me funny. God don't pay no attention to that. Why should he? They reject him. And what they, their idea of praying to is not even him. Why should he acknowledge that? Why should he answer any of those prayers? Yeah, amen. You know what, listen, you know what the idea of a Catholic praying for you is? If he's a devout Catholic? He's going to recite some prayers. You see... Some of us, you've been saved for a while and been around, uh, pray. listen, you realize what real prayer is. It's intercession for other people and praying for yourself and praying for things. You talk to God. You, why? Because we have access to the throne room. We, we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find grace and mercy and help in time of need. They don't have that. You do. Why? Because you have fellowship. You have fellowship. And we know that Jesus Christ is the means of that. Without Him, with listen, I, brother, when we say Jesus Christ is our all in all, He is. Without Him, God wouldn't pay, He wouldn't give you five minutes. You need to think about that for a minute. Listen, do you know that there's all kind of people out there right now, they're headed for hell. And God isn't losing any sleep over it, and He's not fretting, and He's not... He's done everything necessary already. He's, he's, called, he's called preachers. He's got Christians all over, the, all, all over the world. But even that, in God and His foreknowledge, He knows that some of them are not going to... They're not going to pay any attention. And some of them... Listen, it could be even to the sense... 
that, that God knows, and they're not even looking for the truth. Why should he bother fooling with them? They hate him. They hate his name. They hate his book. Why should he fool with them? He's already given them Calvary. See, people look at all that stuff, and what about the heathen that don't know? Well, what about them? You're looking at it through eyes, maybe from a, from a, from a if, if I can use the word, from somewhat of a Christian standpoint. You need to look at it through God's eyes. I forget who the missionary was now. I heard him talking about that thing, and he said he, God called him to Africa, and he went. And he got over there, and he had this burden. He, he said, I had this burden for lost souls. He, we've heard it preached and preached and preached, and I believe, I believe that. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a burden for lost souls. You ought to have that. But that, that ought not be the main thing that drives you. Your love for your Savior is, is what ought to drive you. But he said, I didn't want to see my fellow man. I didn't want to see him die and go to hell. I didn't want to see my fellow human beings. I, I didn't want to see them die and go to hell. So I went to Africa. And he said, I got over there and I started preaching to them the gospel of Jesus Christ and preaching the Bible to them. And I found out they'd already heard about Jesus Christ. And I found out they didn't like Jesus Christ. And they loved their sin. And they didn't want anything to do with God. And they wanted me to just leave them alone. Well, you think God knew that? Listen, God didn't. Whether God sent the man or not, I mean, said he was called. I'm simply saying this, God has given them Calvary, given a, a conscience in their heart and that kind of thing. Listen, they have no fellowship with God. God has done everything necessary. So when they start all these prayers, when tragedy happens, when tragedy happens, it's, oh God. Now I know, preaching this kind of stuff rubs people the wrong way, but it's true. Well, you have a fellowship with Jesus Christ. I get off some of that stuff. You have a fellowship with Jesus Christ. You have a fellowship with God, and it's all in Jesus Christ. He is the means of eternal life. And then notice verse 5. Let's look here. Now, uh, this then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. All right, the message. Because of Christ, we have eternal life. Because of Christ, eternal life, and His blood, we have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. Now, after salvation, now we know all that stuff is conditioned. Fellowship is conditioned on, on, on Jesus Christ for any lost man. He has to be saved first. He has to have eternal life. But from, from here on out, from, from salvation on, this fellowship with God, a lot of it is going to depend on you. It's going to depend on you. I'm not, listen, God will uh, uh, minister to you. God will deal with you. God will speak to you. God will speak to your heart and those kind of things. God will uh, uh, put things in your life. Uh, God will do all those kind of things. God can use any of that kind of stuff, you know, give you dreams. and I'm just kidding. I'm seeing if you're awake. Don't bank on a dream. Please. Please. Someone's saying a while back, had a dream, this, that, and the other, and I thought, okay, and they're talking about the Lord and all that. Well, we'll see if it comes true. It didn't. <laughs> Dreams. Anyway, uh, your fellowship now, uh, from here on out, is going to depend largely on you. And you'll notice in the context, now what comes into play here. In verse 5, 6, and 7, notice what it says. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So, simply put, you've you got to be in the light. So, oh, we've heard this preacher, we know that it doesn't make any difference. Uh, whatever comes down the road next week and... Whatever, whatever happens with our government, you know, I don't remember who it was now, sent me that clip. We watched it the other day. Somebody was showing me something about uh, Gerald Ford talking about uh, in America one of these days. I mean, this guy's, I guess, prophesying, if you will, <laughs> one of these days. He's talking about the demise of American politics. Anybody see that? Who showed me that? Anybody here? Don't be afraid. We're not going <laughs> to. 
It may be, and who knows? I can't remember who it was now. But I was telling Brother Jim about it, my dad. But, but he's in his, like a press conference, and he's, he's, and he's talking about the political demise of America, and, and he's talking about how it's going to happen. And he said, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have, you're going to have a, a president, and he's going to have a female vice president. You're going to have a man and a woman. <laughs> he said, whatever the case, whatever the means, something's going to happen to the president, and the female's going to take over. Now, I'm, I'm ad-libbing, obviously. He's a lot more detailed. And, 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 he, said, and, and he said, when that happens... <laughs> Now, relax, okay? I'm not saying that he had the Spirit of God on him and this is exactly true. But it sure was kind of ironic. <laughs> okay? So just relax. And he said, and when that happens, he said, as far as the American male ever seen the White House again, he said, good luck getting it. <laughs> he said, because that woman's going to take it over. <laughs> you say, I don't know, flip a quarter, you know? And then he said, it probably happened about, and they, they cut the time off. <laughs> so you couldn't. And I, I don't know. But I know this. You don't know what's going to happen next week. And I'm not, God forbid, I'll say something like this. You know, who knows, come flying through the door. But you don't know what's going to happen to Joe Biden tonight. <laughs> he might die of old age. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Amen. Is that not a factor? He could have a heart attack before the day's out. Gone. And then it's President Harris. And you see? Oh, God help us. Yeah, when the, when the, when the, wicked, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. <laughs> and who knows? Who knows what will happen after that? So what are you going to do? Listen, say what you want to from the days way back, the McCarthy days and all that. Listen, the communists have been trying to take over America for how long now? This is no surprise. What if, what if they succeed? You know how many of them that we got in office? Offices? You know how many of them we have uh, socialists in our colleges? And they're pumping it out 24-7 for the last, what, 50, 60 years or better? I don't have the quotes uh, uh, to, to give you from some of these guys, Karl Marx and Lenin and these guys, and some of these, and talking about how to, how to do their thing. It's a slow process. And through the schools and the means of this and the politics and the propaganda and the media. Slow process, but slow, slow but sure. Oh, America, America, founded on God and the Bible and its principles. The average guy out there, he don't pay no attention to the Bible. They don't pay attention to the Bible and what God says. They don't care what God says. They're living their life for right now, the immediate right now. What's good for me and what's good for my pocketbook right now. Amen. What if they do? What if, what I'm saying, what if happens next week? How, what's going to happen to your Christianity? I mean, if something like that were to happen in our government, and you did have a big, you said, we've already seen it, preacher, last lecture, but a big shift and swing to the, to the socialistic. What if Bernie Sanders would have got in there? Yeah, he did. <laughs> I don't, I'm not trying to get political. I'm trying to keep this thing where we're living. This is where we're living. I've come to the fact and the realization you don't have to take this method whether you want to vote, not vote, whatever that's your business, your privilege, whatever it is. But they're going to do what they want to do. I can throw my vote at it and spit in the wind. <laughs> but we're going to pray that God keep them busy doing whatever they're doing and help us to do what we're supposed to do in the midst of it all and just go on and serve God anyway. Okay, so your taxes are going to, they're going to go up. It, man, preacher, preacher, doom and gloom. Hey, man, hang on. 
But I'm saying, whatever comes down the road, all that stuff going on up there in the higher ups and filters down into the local economies and politics and all that stuff and see all these kinds of things going on in COVID and all this stuff. And, and people get very fearful, don't they? You know what my Bible says? What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. What does he say over in Isaiah? I will trust and not be afraid. If you're, I'm just simply saying, preacher, I might lose my job. What if? Some of you are looking at that. You're facing that. What if? I'm not saying this isn't hard stuff, and I'm not even saying, bless God, what's wrong with you? You're wicked. You ain't spiritual. I'm not saying that. We're all flesh. But I'm saying this, no matter what happens, you say it's easy for you to say, how, what makes you always say that? God is not dead. He's still on the throne. He can supply you with another job. It may not be what you want. It may be worse. It may be better. I have no idea. But I know this. God said I'll supply your needs. Didn't he? I, I have, and you know, who knows? I, Lord may test my, put my feet to the fire on some things. But let's, let's turn the tables a little bit. You know what pays my salary? It's what you, your jobs, what you put in the box. You don't think I sit and run the table and think about that down the future? Okay, now what if, what if, they, what if our people start losing their jobs and our offerings dip down and next thing you know we're losing money, losing money, losing money? I'm... So you'd have to go to work, preacher. Okay. What if I couldn't find a job? What if I lost my house? All I'm saying is, whatever, whatever comes down the road, I don't know what it might be. This church, instead of growing like we wanted to, it may dwindle some. Do you ever think about that stuff? Does that mean that, listen, I know that can mean all kinds of things, but does that mean we're doing something wrong? Does, or does that mean that it's the signs, just the times in which we live? I mean, Paul didn't have great success everywhere he went. If you're preaching the Bible and you're praying and you're doing what God told you to do and you're putting your heart into it, does that mean that we're going to be busting out the seams? And that God's just going to bring the people in and dump them on us? What, well, okay, what if it kind of goes the other way? You know the devil's hard at work. He don't stop. I'm saying this. You better get your nose in that book. And you better walk in some light. And in the light of that book, that's a very practical book. Very, so what do you mean when you say practical? It's good for everyday living. God, listen, God knows, He knows what year it is. He knows your health conditions. He knows, he knows the ins and outs of your family. He knows where you work. It didn't take Him by surprise. I mean... I mean, did God give you the job? When he gave you the job, he was like, Woo, glory to God. Lord sure is good. He blessed me with the job. Okay, what if he takes it away? What if he's using this to take it away? <laughs> you say, no, I don't know what to think now. I'm just saying. It may or may not be the case. You have to get in that book and get some light of your own. I'm just throwing some stuff at you today. Because we're going to face some stuff. We're going to face it. If the Lord tarries, we're, it's right here. <laughs> I don't always have all the answers. But God does. Listen, what may be good for the Fall family might not be good for the Barker family. And what might not be good, what's good for them and what's good for them might not be good for the Watkins family which might not be good for the Combs family, which might not be good for the, for the Quigley family. You don't know. 
You better walk in some light. Why? Listen, everybody's different. Your kids are different than mine. Mine's different than yours, so on and so forth. You better get in that book and find, get some light on the subject and have your fellowship in step with God where it's supposed to be so you will know what to do and where to take the next step. Amen. Psalm 119, you know the verses. 130, verse 130, the entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. It giveth understanding. What are you saying? You cannot, if you're going to have fellowship with God, outside of that fellowship, you're not going to get his understanding. Outside of and, and fellowship with God, you have to, you have to have Bible. You have to have Bible reading and you need Bible preaching. You have to have, that is light. That is God giving you light. And if you want some understanding from God, you must avail yourself to it. You must. There is, listen, man, quit drifting along and just randomly, uh, I think this is the best decision. I know sometimes you feel like you're in that circumstance, and I'm not saying it'll be, oh, God's making it super clear all the time. I'm not saying that. But don't you get tired of, listen, some Christians, they operate on the, on the basis of just common logic all the time instead of, and they assume that that's what God, that's how God thinks. Not always. God's working. I may not even get to the rest of this. God's, God, God's working in Job's life, right? And you know what he does? He takes away. He's taking, he's taking. Job is losing. He's taking. And Job, what is it about Job? He has enough discernment about him to know, okay, uh, Lord, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. What? Where did you get that? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> Maybe you will have to sell something. What if I did have to sell my house and a car? What if you do have to downsize? Oh, great tribulation. What if you do have to quit eating out so much? You see, when this thing really gets down to it, and I'm not belittling, listen, I, some of you, you may walk the line already. Maybe you already... I, I just know this. They said about Hudson Taylor. They said about, uh, was it Hudson Taylor? No, Adoniram Judson. They said about Adoniram Judson, he spent much time in prayer. And his children knew when he was praying. So why? He would get up in the mornings and he would walk. And they would look out the window and they'd see Papa. They called him Papa. They would see Papa walking and they'd say, Papa's praying. You know what he spent his time doing? Talking to God. And you read, about, you read about Adoniram Judson and some of the stuff he faced uh, through the first 10 or 15 years of his ministry and all that. You talk about hardships. You talk about struggles, imprisonments and all that kind of stuff and rejections and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he buried his little girl. He'd comment on, the, on, the, on, on her and how pretty she was and this and that and the other. And, and um, what got him through all that? Some of these guys, they're burying three and four kids and two and three wives on mission fields. And they'll come home for furloughs, but yet they go right back. You look at it and you go, what is this, a glutton for punishment or what? No, there's something going on there called Fellowship with their Savior and with their God. It's more than just 
it's more than a formality. It's more than just a, it's more than just determination and grit. It's, it's a fellowship with God. I, I still don't feel like I'm quite down there where you live. Okay, we got all this stuff going on in the country, and you look at it, and you go, I ignore half of what they say anyway, preacher. I'm not paying attention to that. I, I don't even watch the news, you know. I, I, I'm doing good just to, just to live our life, come to church, try to be a blessing, and okay, okay, fine. And then, then, then and some of you, you're just getting started and all that. Okay, fine. Okay, I'm telling you right now, trouble will come your way. It will come your way. You bank on it. So that scares me. Well, prepare. How do I prepare? Get close to God. Fellowship. I'll say the most important thing. Your fellowship is the most important thing that you can ever have in this world. It's the only thing that will get you. I know it's God's grace. Now, how do you avail yourself to God's grace? Fellowship. And how do you do that? You've got to get under the lamp. You've got to get under the light of that book. The entrance of thy words giveth light, giveth understanding to the simple. He also says, Psalm 119, 105, you know the verse, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I see Christians all the time, they do things, they make decisions without God's approval, without seeking God's face, without, again, I don't, I'm not saying I, I know the answers for what's facing us and all that with some of these things, but I know this, seek God's face. Don't be hasty. Don't be hasty in making a decision. Preacher, I'm looking at a deadline. I got, I got till such and such a day to make. Okay, don't be hasty. It's, it's kind of like, it's, it's, man, that's hard. I know it is. It's kind of like, you know, on the front lines during the Civil War days. You're lined up there, and the guy, and the general's telling you, don't, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. You know how close that is? I want to be lobbing something long way out there. Because if I can see his, the whites of his eyes, he can see mine. And the anticipation and the nervousness and the anxiety that would come with that probably is tremendous. Just waiting, 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 waiting until finally you hear, fire! It's about time. Well, don't be hasty. You know what God says a lot of times in the Bible? Wait, wait, I say on the Lord. You know there's some light in that? You know who's a fool is hasty. You know, usually a lot of times, I mean, in construction site you see this. And maybe you see this in other work areas, I don't know. But in construction site you see this. You see a guy who is completely green, brand new. He, he, he don't know what a two-before is. You say, good, that, he, don't, you know, he, don't, he don't understand the, the, the language. He don't, uh, he don't know what certain tools are. And I've watched them. And different guys will start barking orders, this, that, and the other. And I, I'm not talking about the practical jokes, you know, to go get this, go get that. I'm not talking about that. But I've watched them when things get moving, going fast, and he'll do this. He'll start to get that. And he'll run over here to get, no, i got to run back over here to get, no, i got to, you know what that is? That's hasty. That's just slow down. Just calm down. You know what some Christians are doing? I got it. I got it. I got it. And you're reading everything you can read. And I'm not, again, I'm not against some of the, you know, it, educate yourself. Find out. But there's but, but the franticness. God, listen, God is still where he's always been. He's not excited. 
Yeah, he's God. I know. You're his child. He cares about you. Does he not? I mean, and God remember Noah. You think God remember his bride? Are you part of his bride? Do you not know that what his bride is going through right now? Sure he does. Get in the Bible. Get some light. All right, then I'm going to say this, and I might just quit. I'm going to say this. Look on down through here. Look at verse uh, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. All right, you've got to get in the light. If you don't get in the light, you don't have fellowship with God. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. You're going to have to keep your sins confessed. That, uh, that's not being saved again and again and again and again and over and not being saved over and over and over again. We're talking about uh, living a sanctified life. We're talking about you sanctifying yourself. We're talking about you putting a check on your thoughts. We're talking about you putting a check on your motives. And we're talking about you putting a check on your actions and your words. And when those things are wrong and it grieves your own conscience, naturally it's going to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And when you do that, you need to say, Okay, Lord, I've sinned there. I want you to forgive me. Would you cleanse me? I know the blood of Jesus Christ, God, His, uh, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Uh, look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and truth is not in us. You're a sinner. You've probably sinned while you're sitting here. Truth be known. If you haven't, you'll sin before the day's out. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's, that's us. Uh, we have a nature in us. We have two natures. We got an old nature and a new nature. And that thing, that thing has not been, if you will, eradicated completely. And you're bent at times. You are bent to do wrong. You have that in you. And it's going to hurt your fellowship with God. A classic example, father, son. When a son does something his father tells him not to do, what happens? It hinders the fellowship. And usually it doesn't work out too good for the son. But let's fast forward a little bit. Let's, let's go beyond the, the, the childhood years where the father can take the son in hand and chastise him and whip him and spank him and so on and so forth. Let's, let's fast forward to a full-grown man, two full-grown men, father and son. When that son does something that, that the father, which would grieve the father, do you think it hurts their fellowship? And the father doesn't come by and just correct it and beat the tar out of him. No, he's a grown man. But you know what happens? It sure does affect the fellowship. Now all of a sudden, I, listen, if that happens between me and my son and certain things go on, let's just say, and I'm not saying anything's going on, so don't get any ideas, but let's just say something was to go on and certain things were said and this and that and the other, and then all, because, all of a sudden now when we get together, it hinders our fellowship. There's probably certain things that I would want to talk about with my son that I can't. Right? You think, listen, I'll say it again. There would be certain things probably probably, in all probability, that I can't talk to my son about because that fellowship just isn't quite right. And for the sake of illustration, I'm, it's not that the, in an earthly sense, you know that, the father, I'm not saying that he's completely right and everything, but in, this, in, the, in the illustration and all that, God, God never does anything wrong. If I was to do that to my father, there'd be certain things. Listen, it would hinder our fellowship. And there'd be certain things that he could not talk to me about because it would be a sore spot. Or maybe I couldn't handle it. And I know this, when you've got sin going on in your life, you know what it does? It grieves God. You know what he wants to talk about? Hey, let's get that thing straightened out. And you don't want to talk about it. You ever see someone like that? I want to talk. Hmm, I don't want to talk about that. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of confessing that sin. Well, maybe that's what God wants to talk about. We're talking about maintaining fellowship. And I know this is this is this is maybe run of the mill standard for you and all that, but it'd be a good thing for you to, to practice daily. 
And, I say, and I'm not saying there ought to be, whatever, you do what you want. But I'm just saying, you know, have a time, you know, okay, Lord, I'm going to confess all my sins. And No. Why don't you just why don't you confess it right there on the spot when you do it. Make short work of it. Make short work of it. When, when you've done something and you know, you know for a fact uh, God convicted you the moment it came out of your mouth, the moment you did it, the moment you thought it, whatever it is, the conviction sets in, oh man, right there, right there. Keep short accounts with God. Confess that sin. Why? To maintain fellowship. You don't want distance between you and the Father when it comes to fellowship. I know He's in you, you're in Him and all that, but you get the idea. We're talking about fellowship. We're talking about walking in the light. How are you going to... Listen, you can't walk in the light. You can't be in that book and not come to a place where, man, I'm, I, I got some stuff I need cleaned up. Because I, I got some sin. Unconfessed sin. They say one of the number one killers amongst Christians. Unconfessed sin. Now I'll go a little further. Listen, unconfessed sin. Talking about confessing your sin. Obviously we don't confess sins to a priest, preacher, anybody else, that kind of stuff. We take them straight to the Lord. But can I say this? Maybe I just step out a little bit here, a little bit. More than just, Lord, forgive me for that. And I know I just told you, I, listen, I just told you quickly as possible. And I, I still believe that. But I think you ought to get around to a time somewhere, okay, Lord, you, you can see, God, that particular thing right there, I've been dealing with that thing for a while. It grieves me. My flesh loves it, but it grieves me afterwards, and I know it grieves you. Lord, let's talk about that thing. What can I do to, 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 to get some victory over this thing? Let's talk about it. You know where you'll wind up? You'll wind up in a church pew. Or you'll wind up in your prayer closet. And not just, forgive me, Lord, and run off. Forgive me, Lord, and run off. And forgive me, Lord, and run, and, and no, because the idea is to maintain the fellowship. God, what do I need to do? Do I need to put some, do I need to put some safeguards? Do I need to put some roadblocks up? Do I, what do I need to do to stop this? This needs to stop. I can't continue this. I'm tired of just, oh, well, we're all flesh. No, I want victory over this thing. I was talking to a man who is somewhat of a, I won't say an authority or an expert, but, and this is going to sound real simple to you, but was some, somewhat of a, a, knows his way around when it comes to dealing with pornography. And when I say that, not that he's engaged in it, but knows how to deal with people that are. And I'll bring that up because that's, I can't remember the statistics now, but I'll say this. It wouldn't surprise me if somebody, somebody sitting in this room right here has, has, has viewed pornography this past week, according to the numbers. God help you if you are. That stuff will eat you alive. But I was talking to this man, and I said, Okay, what do you, how do you deal with this? How do, you, how, how do you help somebody that's got a problem with that? Number one, they've got to be honest. They've got to be honest. If they're not honest, you're wasting your time. That's a given probably on anything. Number two, you need to learn what they call trigger points. What flips the trigger? I won't go into detail with that. You understand what I'm saying. Right? Note the trigger marks. Write them down. Whatever you've got to do, note them. Now I'm saying this because I'm saying this can be applied to just about any sin. 
But he said, note the trigger points. And when they pop up, have an escape route. Know how to defuse the trigger point. Note the trigger points. Okay, I don't have mine on me. If that's a trigger point, get rid of it. Oh, but preacher, well, get a flip phone. Do they still make flip phones? Go with no phone. You probably could live. You probably could survive. Anyway. Note the trigger points. Have something in place to where, if, you, if, if possible, get rid of the trigger point, or when it does pop up, because you can't control every situation, to defuse it. And then thirdly, have some accountability with someone like your spouse, your husband, or your wife. That's a good one, especially with that kind of issue. Amen? That you, that you are accountable to. That's, that's not bad. That's not bad. I mean, hey, fellas, could you just take your phone and just hand it to your wife and say, here, go ahead, check the... Check whatever I have viewed on the internet. Check whoever I have talked to. Go ahead. Got nothing to hide. If you can't, shame on you. Amen. Vice versa. Ladies, what's good for the goose? Good, whatever. You get the point. I had that backwards, but. Amen. So what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about confessing sins. More so than just, you know, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Okay, let's, let's take some action here. Let's do some preventive maintenance. Right? And what they say, preventive maintenance is the best maintenance. And it is. Okay, let's, let's put an end to some of this stuff. Let's, let's clean it out. I know the Lord has to help you and do it, but you've got a brain. God's given you a book. I mean, you're having trouble with your thoughts. Thy word, we mentioned it this morning in Sunday school, thy word have I hid in my heart that I fill your head with that book instead of sitting down and just surfing, put it down and pick up your Bible. Well, I only got, only got five minutes here. So what? Get it for five minutes. So what if it's 10 minutes? I'll go a little further. So what if you don't understand everything you're reading? Put the book in. Put the book in. Put the book in. Get it on audio. Plug it into your phone somehow. Some app, some iPod. Whatever you got to do, but get the Word of God in there instead of viewing stuff all the time that you shouldn't see or read. Confession of sins. It's very, very key, as you can see there, uh, with maintaining fellowship with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Keep short accounts with God, and it wouldn't hurt you, it wouldn't hurt you to put some things in place. Now, I just gave you an example of, of one or two there, but man, get on your face and ask God, Lord, give me some help here. Give me some direction. I know some things in the Bible, are, it's just clear. Listen, there, and I'll say this too. Sometimes they're in a method for everything. There's some things the Bible says, don't do that. And the, the bottom line is, you don't do that. Well, how do I not do that? You just don't do it. There's some things that are that way. Well, I just can't help it. We'll help it. There are some things that are that way. Well, I just can't. Yes, you can. There are some... Now, listen. I realize there are some things that are more complicated. I'm not saying that. And there are, it's good to have uh, maybe uh, some steps involved. But there are some things where, hey, don't be lying. Okay, don't lie. When the urge is there, don't lie. Don't do it. Or when the temptation is there to gossip or kick another brother or whatever sister, don't do it. Don't be a tailbearer. 
Lord says you're not supposed to do that, right? Well, some things are kind of, uh, you don't need uh, 15 chapters on how to have a deeper walk with God. Just don't do it. Recognize the sin. You get illumination on the thing. Recognize what it is. That's not right. Okay. De decide. Determine in your heart. Ask God for help and grace. And don't do it. And But then if you do, get forgiveness. Confess your sin. Take it to the Lord and ask Him to forgive you. All right. I, I got more here, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop there. I'm talking about fellowship. Listen, if, if you want to carry on and you want to finish till Jesus comes, you're going to have to maintain your fellowship with, with, with Jesus Christ. And that fellowship comes, I, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat nothing, it comes with a price. Salvation was free. All you had to do was ask. But, but fellowship comes with a price. That's you. Fellowship. If any man follow me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. You've got to deny yourself. That's you. That's a price. That's fellowship. How far do you want to walk with God? How far, how close do you want to get with God? There is a price, but it's worth it. I don't, I don't want to make that sound like God is not uh, uh, a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Because he is. But there's a price. So what was it going to cost me? It might cost you time. It might cost you money. It might cost you health. I don't know. It, it might cost you some worldly possession. It might cost you some... Um, who knows what it might cost you? But do you want to finish? Now, looking around the room, most of you, I, I, I honestly believe you wouldn't be here today if you didn't want to finish. You, you would not be here today if you didn't really, if, if this didn't matter to you, and this wasn't just some crutch and some social uh, activity that we do once or twice, three times, four, whatever, a week. If it really didn't matter to you, if, if the lives around you and it didn't matter to you concerning them, I, if, it, if it really didn't, I don't think you'd be here if it really didn't matter to you. But the question still stands, how is your fellowship? Now, you can say what you want to, but if you let, if you let it in there, whatever it is, long enough between you and your Savior. I heard someone preach this. Maybe you heard it. I heard it on Final Fight. It's been some time ago. But it, he said this. I don't remember who the guy was preaching. He said this. Sin is a multiplier. Sin always multiplies. It never lays stagnant. It never lays, it never lies dormant. If you allow it to be there, as you allow it to be there, some way, somehow, it's multiplying. And he used several different Bible illustrations, but he used David as one. I'm trying to hurry and finish here. He used David one night. One night. One night with a woman. It's ugly, I know it, and, 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 and we love David, and I'm looking forward to seeing him and all, amen? But you, you examine that man, and you examine his walk with God, and although he, he managed to, if you will, finish, you know what David maintained? He maintained his fellowship. And he confessed it when he, of course it took him a while, but he finally got there. But you look at that sin, the longer he left it lay and didn't deal with it, it kept multiplying. I mean, you look even down through, the, down through the chronicles of his life, it multiplied. 
And I don't have time to go through all how it multiplied, but it kept on multiplying. It, it manifested itself not only in the, in the death of, of, of four boys, but it manifested itself in Absalom's life tenfold. Did you hear me? Tenfold. multiplies 10 to 1 those aren't those aren't numbers you want to deal with you got something in the way you got something that's not really been addressed and taken care of and I know this is a small crowd today and what it doesn't matter we've got what God wants us to have we're here, we're here to hear from God. Okay, let's, let's serve the Lord. Let's worship God. Let's do business with God. Here we are. Amen? David talks, <clears throat> excuse me, David talks about his secret sins. You got any secrets? I'll be honest with you. This sermon did not go this way. You can look at my notes. It doesn't go this way. You got any secret sins? Breaking your fellowship? Listen, you're sitting here, you got a Bible on your lap. Amen. Praise the Lord. God's good. Amen. Lord's good. We've been praying. Lord's. Yeah, but you got that one or two. It's multiplying. You better deal with it. You better address it. You want to finish? Listen, I can sit here right now, and I'm not being ugly. I'm not trying to be condescending to anybody. You know why some people aren't here today? Because the fellowship was broken with God, and they wouldn't deal with it. Oh, they can blame the preacher. They can blame another brother or sister. Fact is, fellowship got... I'm talking about they're out. Fact is, fact is, fellowship got broken, and they wouldn't deal with it. Maybe you need to deal with it. Let's stand for prayer.